I need you to know that the last few weeks, from the beginning of the year up to this point, I have spent time in different conferences across North America meeting with pastors. But now, Pastor Dan and Lois, I get to Central California Conference and I see pastors, but I also see elders. Ha! Ah, I think that is awesome. Because, you know, across North America, in some places, other than Central California, pastors and elders at times, they are not together. At times, they fight. At times, they antagonize each other. Uh, but I know that that does not happen here in Central California. Can someone say amen? amen? Some of you are saying amen. Some of you are clapping. And some of you are smiling. There is always a pastor who fights an elder, and there is always an elder that antagonizes a pastor. Um, but I know that doesn't happen here in this great conference. Amen? Amen. People usually know who that pastor is and who that elder is. If you don't know who that pastor is or who that elder is in this conference, it may be you. Ah! It is great to be able to be with each and every one of you here as we begin this historic retreat. And I'm going to take this back across the North American division. Perhaps it is time that we start having more meetings together with our elders and our pastors because we need to be working together in order to build God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. So you're setting a trend. And as I got here today, I was wondering if you realize that you get to minister in one of the most beautiful territories of the entire North American division. I don't know. I don't know if you realize that. That's why you got Pastor Dan Cerns. You know, he took off running from Texas and came over here because it's so beautiful. I, I got to be careful because this has been recorded and the brethren from Texas probably going to watch this at some point. But the Monterey Bay, yeah, was, what a beautiful academy. <laughs> you guys are having too much fun already. The National Parks, Yosemite, with the waterfalls, ha! Ah. The Sequoia National Park. This is all in your territory. Beautiful cities, like this one where we're in, Fresno and San Jose. Some people are laughing about San Jose. San Jose has some, has some great things, amen? Especially the name, Jose, amen? Your youth director, Jose Pagan, is very happy right there because he says the name, San Jose. St. Joseph, right, San Jose. Your sports teams, help me out. What, help me out with your sports teams, all right? 49ers, 49ers all right, 49ers. The Giants, the Warriors. the Warriors, you know, they are the champs right now. Well, they are the champs, but we do need to pray for them. I think they were losing earlier today when the Sabbath broke. Careful, Danny, careful. Dan, this guy here, Danny, I know him from the time he was a little kid in Potomac Conference. Okay, I was his youth director, and he took off running to Central Cal because it's more beautiful. Well, I got to be careful with Potomac <laughs> people watching. But I want to say one thing right now as we get going. What's most beautiful about Central California, and what God loves most about Central California is not the bay. It's not the national parks. It's not your beautiful cities or your great sports teams. You want to know what God loves most, what's most beautiful about all of Central Cal? It is you. Ah, I 
and you uh, and the people who live in your city and the people who live all around you and your neighbors and your classmates and your workmates and uh, those are the people that God that is what God loves most about Central California can someone say amen, amen. and I want to say this to you tonight it is not a coincidence that you live and that you minister in this territory God has placed you here because there are people all around you, in your cities, in your communities, in your neighborhoods. There are people who need Jesus and God has placed you right there so you can be a blessing to each and every one of them. Amen? So as I was getting ready for today, for this weekend, I began to ask God and I said, God, this is a historic meeting. Historic gathering of pastors and elders. First time that, that Central Cal, and as far as I am concerned, first time that I see this across our division. What do you want me to say to them? Because I take this very seriously. Every time that I get the opportunity, and it is probably three, four, five times a week, to present the word to God's people are taken seriously. And God gave me something and then tonight as I got here, he gave me something else. And I hate when God does that to me. So God gave me one thing. Tonight, I'm just going to say one thing. Are you ready? Are you ready? Simple. Here it is. This is a message from God to the pastors and elders and spouses of Central California Conference tonight. Listen. God loves you. God loves you. My brother, sister, your wife, God loves the two of you. Ha. My brother, I love the way you play the piano, and I am assuming that your wife is the one that was leading. That's you know, you know, God loves you. Ha. Right there, Jose and Martita, you know, God loves you. Back there, I see a brother wearing a nice pink shirt. Brother, that looks nice. You're a colorful type of guy. It's you. Yeah, you. Don't, don't, it's you. Yeah, that's right. Can you put your hand up so everybody knows who you are? Brother, it's you. You're right next to the guy with the white shirt. He's looking at you right now. It's you. Yeah, put your hand up, man. Put your hand up. It's you. He's saying it's not pink. It looks pink from here, brother. God loves you regardless of the color of your shirt. Pastor Ricardo Viloria, back there, our ministerial director, God loves you. If we are going to arise and go, we cannot do it unless we have the assurance of God's love for us. Amen. I know that you have heard this before. And perhaps by now you're asking, and Pastor Jose, do you come all the way from the North American division? Do you come all the way from Maryland just to tell me that God loves me? Yes, I did. <laughs> because there is nothing more important. There is nothing that is higher. There is nothing that is deeper. There is nothing that is wider than God's love for you. Amen. Turn to the person next to you for a moment. And I know some of you are introverts and you don't like talking to people, but you're elders and you're pastors. We're here for people. Amen. Ha. And tell the person next to you, God loves me. Ha. Come on, go ahead, go ahead. And now you can say, and he loves me too. Listen up. 
He knows your life. And he loves you. He knows your struggles. And he loves you. He knows that I am a broken person. And he loves me. Let me, let me be very open and very vulnerable with you here tonight. I've been an Adventist for 50 years. I was born, well, I was born, I was going to say I was born in the church. I was born in the hospital. Amen. Uh, and right after I was born in the hospital, they took me to church. My great-grandmother was an Adventist. My grandmother was an Adventist. My parents are Adventists. I'm an Adventist. My kids are Adventists. I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to prove anything here. Just hear me out. I'm a pastor. Then someday someone decided that they wanted to, to, to ask me to serve, to, to minister to pastors all across our division. I get to go out and preach to people all the time, believers and non-believers and church leaders. You're wondering, why is he saying all of this stuff? Why is he giving us his resume? I have a point. I get to do all of these things, but I still struggle every single day of my life. Ha! Don't look at me as if you don't. And I need the mercy and the grace of Jesus every single morning of my life. Amen. That is why one of my favorite Bible verses and promises in the Bible is the one that says that his mercies are new every morning because I need his mercies every morning. Amen. Thank you God for your mercies for me and for my brothers and sisters every morning. Amen. He knows you. He knows me. And he still decided that he wanted to love me and to love you. He knew you from way before you were born. He knew some of the decisions, all of the decisions that perhaps you were going to make. He knew some of the things that you were going to do right, some of the things that you were going to do wrong, and he still decided to love you. He knows how you treat your spouse ah, when you're not in front of people. Why are you guys laughing like that? And someone is saying, that's right. He knew the things that you say to your kids when you get upset with them. Ah. Confession time here. I thought I was the best father that there was till I got caught up in the pandemic with two of my kids for a whole year in the house. <laughs> and he still loves me. Pastor, how do you know that he loves us even when we're not that good? Let's go to our Bibles. And this is my scripture for tonight. And I'm sorry, my voice doesn't seem to be coming through. I guess that all of the traveling today did something to me. So I hope that you can get me okay. Let's go to our Bibles to Romans 5 and verse 8. Another one of my favorite Bible passages in Scripture. And it says there, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. He did not wait for you to have it all together. He did not wait for you to be perfect. He did not wait for you to, to be someone that can boast about all of the wonderful things that you have in your life. He died for you at your worst. And that's why as we get going tonight, I wanted to set this foundation. Because I have heard from some of our high Adventist pulpits, things like the love of God is important, but everybody talks about that. 
We need to talk about other things because we're different. Really? At the expense of God's love? I have heard from Adventist pulpits and I know that that doesn't happen here in Central Cal. It's in other places. But I have heard I have heard people refer to God's love as milk. Yeah, you know, God, the, the, the love of God, that's milk. We need some solid food. That's soft food. We need meat. And at times, the very same people who are willing to crucify others over meat are saying, we need meat. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen here in Central Cal. This love thing, this love thing, referring to God's love as this love thing. We need more sound doctrine. More sound doctrine than the love of God. And I'm here tonight to tell you that God's love is the most solid teaching of Scripture. Amen? It is the most awesome fact of the Bible, and it is the most awesome fact in your life. There is nothing, as I said before, that is better, that is bigger, that is greater than God loves for you. So, my dear brothers and sisters, dear pastors and dear elders, the love of God should be the most cherished doctrinal possession of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen? This is present Truth. Amen. I'm glad for the three of you who are clapping. I hope that most, more of you will catch up that. Without God's love, there is no creation. Without God's love, there is no family. Without God's love, there is no Sabbath. Ah, without God's love, there are no commandments. Without his love, there would not be a cross. Without his love, there would not be a resurrection. Without his love, there would not be a sanctuary. Without his love, there would not be a three angels message. Without his love, there would not be a second coming. Without his love, there would not be a health message. Without his love, there is no church. Without his love, there is no Central California Conference. Without his love, there is nothing. Am I making myself clear tonight? There is nothing more important than his love for you and for me. And that needs to be clear if we're going to arise and go. Amen. Don't tell me it is baby food. I'm not a baby. I am 50 years old. And any time that I hear someone say, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you that he gave his only son, that you may have life, everlasting life, something warms up inside of me. Every time that I hear someone tell me, God loves you, I receive life because I need his love every day. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me break this down a little bit more for you. I have two kids. Tomorrow I'm going to show you photos of my family. I have a beautiful family. My youngest one, by the way, he's having a birthday today. And, and let, me, let me be very open with you here. We celebrated his birthday on Wednesday, celebrated his birthday on Thursday, yesterday, celebrated his birthday at 5 o'clock this morning before I left, and we're going to celebrate his birthday again on Sunday morning when I'm back home, amen? So, so I did all of that, you know, in order to be able to come here and be with you. <laughs> Don't do as I do. <laughs> This morning, when I was leaving, he said, Papa, this is the first time ever that you're not going to be with me for my birthday. I said, what do you mean I'm not going to be with you? I am with you right now, and we celebrated Wednesday and Thursday. So because of that, you get some extra birthdays, you know, so it's okay. So he, he said, okay. I came with his permission. But he was about to turn three years old. 
And I remember asking him, baby, what would you like for your birthday? I'll tell you a story here. Follow me. There is a point. And he had been watching a cartoon that was on back during those days. Toy Story. Ha. And he said, Papa, you know what I like. And it is true. He, he loved Toy Story to the point that, that in the morning after we did worship, he would come to me and he said, Papa, can I watch Toy, Toy Story? And I would say, sure, baby, but, but at home we had kind of like a little bit of a rule that you could only watch an hour of TV a day at that time because they were little. And, and he would say, Papa, it's a little bit over an hour, so can you do a little bit of an extra permission so I can, you know, he would kind of find all of these words to ask for extra time. So I would let him watch the entire Toy Story. He would finish watching it and he would come back to me and he would say, Papa, it is over, it's finished. But I would like to watch it again. And I would say, baby, but you already watched it once, and, and it's okay. We only do an hour. I'll let you go for an hour and a half. And he would say, Papa, but they have it in Spanish. Ah. And he would say, you want me to be bilingual? <laughs> so this is educational. He would jump like this and say, Papa, educational. <laughs> Sometimes I would let him watch it again, and then when, when it was done in Spanish, he would come back, and he would say, Papa, they have it in French. Ah. I could be trilingual, Papa. That's how much he loved his Toy Story cartoon. So he said, Papa, you know, you're asking me what I want for my birthday. I, I would like one of the characters of the, of the movie. So who, who's that? I said, he said, Buzz Lightyear. The little robot that flies and does all these kinds of things and talks and, and dances. For those of you that never watched it. So I said, okay. Ran to the store. Back in those days, we used to have Toys R Us. I think they still have one or two in Canada. I saw it the other day. And I noticed that there was an entire aisle, Pastor Viloria, an entire aisle of, on, on Toy Story. And as soon as I went and I saw that aisle, I noticed that, that they had Buzz Lightyear. And I said, man, this is exactly what my boy is asking me for. And I went and I looked and there was a small one like this, $9.99. <laughs> we were living in New York back in, the, in those days. So uh, $9.99 for a toy for, uh, on a pastor's salary is perfect in New York. <laughs> so I picked it up. And as I was getting in and, and getting ready to run with it, uh, I noticed, I looked a little bit to my left, and I noticed that there was a bigger one. And I said, I cannot take this little one. My son is only going to be three once in his life. I, I, need, to, I need to get him the, 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 the bigger bus light here. And I cannot just take the little one. And, and then I looked at the price, $49.99. Uh, did they ever sing that song to you, big, Little Eyes? Little Eyes, uh, be careful what you see. Cuidadito los ojitos. I don't know it in English. How does it seem similar? Be careful, little eyes, with what you see. Ah, okay, you oh, see. So when I got ready to take that bigger one, I looked again. And then I saw the big one. And I said, I cannot take this uh, the small one or the mid sized one to my son. He's only going to be three once in his life. I need to take the big one. And I grabbed the big one without looking, and then I did a double take, and I looked, 99, 99, plus tax. <laughs> I ran to the cashier, gave it to the lady. My credit card didn't want to come out of my pocket, but it did finally. I handed the credit card to the lady, and it went through, ha. Ah. Asked them to pack it to, to, to wrap it really nice. Going somewhere with this. 
took it home. Birthday came. We got up early like we did today. Well, maybe not that early. And, and we sang happy birthday with a cake to, to Joel Benjamin Cortez. He blew the candles, did not spit on them or anything, you know, just blew the candles. And then we said, do you want some cake? And he said, no, I don't want cake. I want my gift. <laughs> and we brought the big box, nicely wrapped. Gave it to him and we said, happy birthday, baby, happy birthday. And he took the gift and he began to unwrap the gift. You could tell that he's someone who has been born in, ab in abundance. Amen. Because in my house, when I was little, uh, and they gave me a gift, my parents taught me that you don't, you don't rip the, the, the wrapping paper. You undo it nicely so they can use it again for the next gift. Amen. <laughs> Some of the Hispanic brothers and sisters know what I'm talking about. Can I have a witness? He was just undoing and, and ripping up the, the, the wrapping paper. And finally, we opened up the box. Got the big bus light here. It was almost as big as him. He saw it. Held it in his hands. And I was hoping for him to start jumping up and down and screaming uh, uh, joyfully and say, Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. I love you. Thank you. Looked at it. Looked at me. His face was not joyful. I'm going somewhere with this. And I said, baby, everything okay? And he said, Papa, no. This one is too big. <laughs> Real story. I wanted the smaller one, Papa. No, but baby, baby, listen, baby, this is the best one that Papa could find. And, and baby, it costs 99 99 plus tax. Baby, you know, Papa is giving you the best gift, the best the boss uh, light here that, that there was in the store. Papa, I know, but, but this is not the one that I want. Papa, I'm little, and this thing is almost bigger than me. I want the little one. <laughs> Baby, no, we got you this one. Push, and he throws it on the floor. I'm looking at my... 99, 99 plus tax on the floor. And I'm saying, what's going on? Picked it up. Gave it to him. I said, baby, listen, next year I'll get you the little one. Take the big one now. And he said, no, Papa, next year I want this one. But this year I want that one. By now, I'm beginning to lose my, my I don't know, I, English is my second language, everybody. So I make up words sometimes. I be, I'm beginning to, to lose my, my Christianhood. <laughs> is that even a word? My fatherhood. Rob, I'm, I'm, is, that, is that understandable? Okay. By now, I'm not feeling, because I'm seeing my, my 99, 99 plus tax on the floor. And this is supposed to be a happy occasion, and it's not being happy. So I'm beginning to, by now, if I had been a Caucasian parent, I would have been like, you go to time out. <laughs> if I had been an African-American parent, I would have been, no, 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 you just didn't do that. But being the Hispanic parent that I am, I was reaching out for the chancleta. Ha! How do you say chancleta in, in English? The slipper. No, the sandal. <laughs> it got to the point that I had to tell him, listen, it's over. You're not, the birthday is over. I'm mad. 
This is not happening. You're keeping that toy. If you don't want, it was, it had like a few pieces were on the floor by now. You know, it's like, that's, you get what you get and that's it. My boy looked at me. And he said, Papa, I still remember his face. Defiant. He said, if you don't get me the gift that I want, I'm going to go to grandpa's house in New Jersey because grandpa is going to get me the gift that I want. We were in New York, Long Island, New York. It was January 20th. There was snow on the ground. And my dad and my mom, they lived in New Jersey. And I said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> True story. And I'm going somewhere with this. Going through all of this because I want you to remember something when we finish here. And he went down the steps, went into his toy room, got his tricycle, you know, a bicycle with training wheels. And I said, where do you think you're going? And he's like, Papa, I'm going to New Jersey. <laughs> I said, okay. Opened the front door with a lot of, you know, he had to, you know, put a lot of energy into it and strength. He got it open. He pulled his bike out to the snow. It was cold. And he started pedaling away on the snow of our driveway to New Jersey. <laughs> True story. He forgot that he was only wearing a little shirt and underwear. <laughs> no shoes. So my wife and I just like, we left the door like that a little bit and we kind of tried to keep looking to see what he was going to do. So let's see how far he can get. <laughs> we had a big rock, it's an, like an ornamental rock uh, right beside the driveway of the house and somehow he managed to crash against that rock. He fell, got up with a lot of determination, and he wiped off the snow, kicked the bike, and right away I could tell that something happened in his face because he wasn't wearing any shoes, so I could see the pain of his toes in his face. He went like this, <clears throat> fine, I'll walk to New Jersey, and he started limping on the driveway got to the end of the driveway looked back at the house looked to the street and I guess he realized that New Jersey was really far away because it went like this again and he said fine I guess I'll go back home and here is where the lesson of this story comes Limp back, limped back to the door, ran the bell, tling. I opened the door and I saw my little baby trembling. And he says, Papa. And I said, Yes, it's cold out here, Papa. And I said, I know, Papa. Do you see me? I'm shaking here, Papa. I'm shaking. Do you see me? And I said, yes, I see you. Papa, look, I think I'm pink, Papa. I think I'm pink because it's too cold. And I said, no, baby, you're not pink. You're purple. <laughs> Papa, I'm in underwear, Papa. I said, I know. And he said, do you think that the neighbors saw me? And I said, yes. And he started crying. Oh. Then he took a deep breath. And he said, Papa, 
Can I come back in the house? What do you think I said? Who said no back there? <laughs> we really need some someone needs Jesus in this room tonight. <laughs> Preaching that message for you, my brother. <laughs> Pick them up. Squeeze them with my, my chest. It was cold. And he started snuggling in my and getting comfortable in my embrace. And I said, baby, you can always come back home. Because Papa loves you. And he's getting all comfortable and everything, and I'm getting ready to come in and close the door, and then he all of a sudden, he pulls back. And he asked me a question that I think that we as Adventists have not completely learned to answer that question yet. And I hope that as we leave this place, as pastors and elders, we leave this place ready, knowing how to answer this question. Because there are many people out there asking this question, and they need a clear answer. He said, Papa... Do you love me even when I'm bad? And I said, of course, baby. I love you when you're good, and I'd rather you be good, but I also love you when you're bad. You know why, baby? Because I'm your dad. You're, my love for you has nothing to do with your behavior. It has everything to do with the fact that you're my baby, and I am your father. Can someone say amen? Amen. I serve, you serve, we serve, and we proclaim a God that loves people when we're good, but he also loves us when we're bad. Amen. Amen. If he only loved us when we're good, he would hardly ever love us. <laughs> and that is a reason why God's love needs to be front and center and all around anything that we do as pastors and as elders. Amen. Amen. Let me make a little bit of a parenthesis here as, as I get ready to close. We're talking about mobilizing. We're talking about creating new groups, forming new groups, planting new churches. We're talking about making invitations and leading people to Jesus so they can be baptized and become disciples of Jesus. Amen. Amen. But if we don't get this one right, all we're going to be doing is creating clubs of Pharisees and those are not good for the church. Amen. Amen. It's okay to clap, my sister. It's okay. You got it right. <laughs> if we don't realize that, that his love is first and foremost, Not only for those who look like us and that behave like us, but for everyone. What are we going to mobilize for? What types of new groups and new churches are we going to plant? Churches that don't believe in the love of God? What type of people are we going to baptize? People that come to impose rules? And regulations as if church was just about rules and regulations. Am I making myself clear tonight? Church is about the love of Jesus first and foremost. Amen. Amen. Let me make this clear. It's time. To start loving each other. It's time to start loving our younger generations. Please stop this fellowshipping younger people when they misbehave. Amen. Pastor, yeah, about the manual. Let me be very clear. We 
When someone misbehaves, they need you more than ever before. When a young person makes a mistake, they don't need to be told, we're going to take your name away from the books of the church till you get better, until you start doing better again. What they need at that moment is an embrace. They need someone to love on them. They need someone to help them through the crisis that they're going through. At times, all they are looking for is an excuse so they can leave the church altogether. Let's not give them that excuse. Amen. Amen. I have this little theory in which I think that sometimes when our younger generations are going through the difficult times, the church turns their back on them. And then they go to school. They get over that period of rebellion. They have their families. They start making money and doing great in life. And then the church wants them back. And many of them say, this church was, was not there for me when I needed the church. I'm doing good now. Making myself clear. A church that has the love of Jesus as first, central, and foremost doesn't kick people out when they are in need. It takes them in. It loves them. It embraces them. It helps them to get over whatever situation they are going through. It points the way in, not the way out. As I close, just want you to know that God loves you. Listen, He loves the younger generation, the ones who sin, and they are so open about life and so transparent that they don't hide it. But He loves you when you sin and you hide it. He sinned. Their sin and your sin, they're all sins. And our God is the same God. So whatever you're going through right now, it can be that you're going through a difficult situation in your home. And maybe it is your fault. God loves you. He wants to help you. It could be that you're washing things that you're not supposed to wash. When, when, you're, when you're all by yourself and everybody else is gone, you, you take that phone and you start washing stuff that you shouldn't be washing. You serve a God who loves you and he wants to restore you. Amen. He's not there trying to punish you. He's trying to restore you. What is it that you're going through? My dear elder, my dear pastor, my dear spouse, he loves you. Never forget that. If we're going to arise and go, this is the foundation. And this is not just something to start. This is something that we start with. And this is something that we keep with us throughout. Because we cannot start without it. But we cannot run the race. And win the race. We cannot plant churches. We cannot baptize people. We cannot mobilize people. And expect great results. Unless. We know. That he loves us. And we know. That he loves others as well. Amen. Amen. So I ask this question as we close. Do you want to accept. The love of God for you tonight. If you want to accept his love for you tonight, can you put your hand up because I want to pray for you. I accept his love tonight. Amen. Now a question. And this is the most difficult one because it's easy sometimes to accept his love for us. But are you going to extend that love to others? If you want to extend that love for others as we mobilize, as we plant new churches, start new groups, 
And as we baptize and make disciples, I want to see you stand. This is not a promise to me. This is not a commitment with me. This is not a commitment with your conference president, with your ministerial director. This is a commitment directly with God the Father, the one who loves you. Amen. Let's go back to our churches. And let's make his love first, foremost, and center, central to anything and to everything that we do. Amen. Dear Holy Spirit, I have sensed your presence in this place tonight. Dear God, thank you for your love for me and for my brothers and sisters here. Thank you because you love us when we're good. And that we realize that that doesn't happen often. Thank you because you love us also when we mess up, when we're bad. Thank you because you don't kick us to the curve. Thank you because you don't close the door on us. Thank you because you look to restore us when we mess up, Lord. And we are grateful for your love for us. So now as we go back, at the end of this weekend, we're going to go back to our churches. Help us to go back affirmed and secure with your love and ready to share that love with others. I pray these things. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Turn to the person around you and, and give him a hug and say, God loves you and I love you too. God bless you. Amen.